Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Detection of Mutations in Cell-Free DNA from Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Using Next Generation Sequencing, presented by Dr. Tracy Stockley, Associate Professor of Princess Margaret Cancer Center. We are excited to bring you this educational webcast presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific Ion Torrent. Powered by semiconductor chips, iron torrent sequencing technology is simpler, faster, and more cost-effective and scalable than other benchtop next-generation sequencing technologies. For more information about our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. I am Marjorie Torres of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower lap of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tracy Stockley. Dr. Stockley is a clinical molecular geneticist and associate director of the Molecular Diagnostics Division at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, providing leadership within the two divisional molecular diagnostics laboratories. For Dr. Stockley's full biography, please visit labroots.com. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy Stockley. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to present today our uh, work at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto on detection of mutations in cell-free DNA from non-small cell lung cancer samples using the Oncomine Life Oncomine Lung CFDNA assay from Thermo Fisher. Thank you. And just to begin, I just want to present the following disclaimer from Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, regarding some of the presentation within my talk. So as an introduction, before I begin speaking about our research study, I'd just like to review non-small cell lung cancer and associated mutations. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related mortality in the U.S. and can be divided into two main subtypes, non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer, which are defined based on features of the tumors. Not part of the reason that lung cancer has such a high mortality is that it is often detected at an advanced stage when the cancer has spread to other regions of the body, including brain, organs such as kidney and liver, or bone. Non-small cell lung cancer can also be divided by the driver mutations that cause activation of signaling proteins leading to tumor genesis. Mutations in the epidermal growth factor receptor protein, EGFR, tyrosine kinase, are one of the most recurrent mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. The EGFR protein is a signaling protein located at the cell surface and has both an extracellular domain that binds ligands such as EGFR, pardon me, such as EGF, epidermal growth factor, and an intracellular domain um, which causes activation of intracellular signaling pathways. For intracellular signaling, the tyrosine kinase domain can bind ATP, which causes dimerization and autophosphorylation, uh, leading to proliferation and survival. There are known various mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain of the EGFR gene, 
And these mutations can cause ligand independent cell proliferation and survival. When certain mutations exist in, in individuals with lung cancer, um, they may have treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which can bind to the tyrosine kinase domain and prevent the ligand independent cell proliferation and survival that is seen in non-small cell lung cancer. And these mutations are found in approximately 10 to 35 percent of non-small cell lung cancer samples. So this slide just shows an overview then of the EGFR mutations and their frequency in non-small cell lung cancer. At the top are mutations that are associated with drug resistance, and at the bottom are mutations associated with drug sensitivity. So the mutations listed on the bottom for drug sensitivity um, are uh, these mutations allow the tyrosine kinase inhibitors to block or inhibit the tyrosine kinase domain functions in the EGFR protein. The most common mutations that are associated with drug sensitivity are deletions in exon 19 of the gene, and um, which occur at about 45 percent, or the L858R variant, which is found in exon 21 of the gene. And in addition, there are mutations that are known to cause drug resistance that prevent the tyrosine kinase inhibitors from carrying out their action. And the most common of these is the T790M mutation, which is found in exon 20. So the EGFR resistance mutation T790M um, the NCCN guidelines currently recommend that samples that have acquired resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitors should be tested for the most common EGFR resistance mutation, T790M. The EGFR T790M mutation can be detected typically in, in one of two ways, either through sampling of a tumor tissue biopsy, although there are challenges to actually obtaining tumor tissue from some of the recurrent sites that I mentioned, or more recently by using circulating cell-free tumor DNA, or CFDNA, which is DNA isolated from peripheral blood uh, research samples. So this slide shows an overview then of circulating tumor cell-free DNA uh, and its origin and how it actually presents in peripheral circulation. Um, Cell-free DNA is released from either healthy or inflamed or diseased, such as tumor tissue, from cells that are undergoing apoptosis or necrosis. And so as these cells are undergoing apoptosis or necrosis, they are releasing DNA fragments into peripheral circulation. The cell-free DNA then in peripheral circulation can be extracted from a blood sample by collecting the serum or the plasma containing the cell-free DNA as a way to separate it from cells that contain genomic DNA still within the cell. And so in this way, the hope is that we can use uh, cell-free DNA in peripheral circulation as an indicator of what is happening within tumors that can't be easily accessed for testing. So to give you an overview then of Princess Margaret Cancer Center and our non-small cell lung cancer testing, we test um, typically more than 2,500 non-small cell lung cancer research samples a year for the EGFR tyrosine um, kinase sensitizing and resistance mutations. We test samples of various sources including FSPE, FNA, um, or transbronchial needle biopsies or core needle biopsies. We have um, several next generation sequencing panels for EGFR and associated genes relevant to lung cancer and other tumors, and real-time PCR methods for specific mutations in EGFR gene. So starting in, in last year in 2016, we did begin to work up next generation sequencing and digital droplet PCR methods for the EGFR T790M resistance mutation on cell-free DNA. And that's what I'll talk about for the remainder of this talk. 
So our approach to, as we began looking at cell-free DNA, um, this, this slide just shows an overview to our approach at Princess Margaret Cancer Center to the pre-analytic phase of cell-free DNA. So we do collect um, the blood for cell-free DNA in STREC tubes, and I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that. Uh, so the, those research samples are collected in STREC tubes. Um, STREC does allow a stabilization of the cell-free DNA, and so the samples can then be shipped at room temperature, which makes sending of samples between sites much easier. Once the samples are received at our site, we spin to isolate the plasma, and then from the plasma extract the cell-free DNA, which we then quantify. So in the, in the study I'll speak about, we um, collected cell-free DNA in struct tubes, as I mentioned. We did collect about 20 mils of whole blood, which resulted in approximately 8 to 12 mils of plasma. And from the 8 to 12 mils of plasma, on the median uh, was about 80 nanograms of cell-free DNA that we extracted. We... Um, Chose is our cell-free DNA next generation sequencing assay, the CFDNA lung assay, oncomine assay from Thermo Fisher. And as an introduction to the Thermo Fisher sequencing system, we have also the PGM and the previous S5 uh, version of the sequencer, but currently we're using the Thermo Fisher Scientific Ion S5XL system. The, the chemistry for sequencing on this platform is to take your DNA fragments with adapters attached, amplify them on ion spheres, and then place the ion spheres within the sequencing plate. Uh, the sequencing plate has an ion-sensitive metal oxide layer at the base and an electronic transistor base sensor as well. And what happens then is as you have your bead with your template attached to it, the reagents including um, uh, deoxy uh, TTPs and DNA polymerase are flowed across the, the plate and this extends from your template and during that extension, hydrogen ions are released. These hydrogen ions are then detected by the plate and result in a read of your sequence as the different um, nucleotides are flowed across the plate. So we do like the Thermo Fisher platform because it does provide the ability to use very low input DNA, which again was part of the reason for us choosing this while working with cell-free DNA. So I'll give a couple overview slides then just of the Thermo Fisher Oncomine CFDNA assays. Um, there are currently three of the assays, the one that we use, the Oncomine Lung CFDNA assay, and also there are two additional assays, the colon CFDNA assay and breast CF, CFDNA assay. So I'll be speaking about the lung CF assay. The lung assay includes 35 um, amplicons and covers the key hotspot mutations in the 11 genes that are listed there, and most importantly for this talk, uh, covers EGFR, and provides coverage then of 169 hotspot SNVs and insertion deletions. And I, I'll speak more about this, but is able to achieve down to a 0.1% limit of detection for the hotspot variants included within that panel. Uh, and again, an overview then of the whole process of, of the assay, the, the sort of critical parts. I, the assay only needs 20 nanograms of input DNA to, to achieve a 0.1% limit of detection. And so this is very helpful. As I mentioned, our median was about 80 nanograms from two tubes of blood. So from one, we had about 40 nanograms median. So this really does allow you to test from one tube of blood um, for a sample. The, um, we have run it on, as I mentioned, the S5XL system, and we actually use the 540 chip, um, but it can also be run on the Proton and the PGM systems. It does cover the critical genes and the critical hotspots. And again, in, if you look at the bottom under critical hotspots, it does include EGFR T790M, as well as the key sensitizing mutations L858R and the XM19 deletions. And an overview then of the workflow of the Oncomine CFDNA assays. As the sample comes in, DNA is isolated using um, your preferred method. 
then the library prep um, is carried out. 20 nanograms is the amount that we used and recommended by the manufacturer, um, although I, I understand it can go lower than that. Uh, the template and sequencing then is, can be set up using the Ion Chef, and we sequence on the Ion F5. Um, and the sequencing, as per usual with the Thermal Fisher platform, is very rapid and, um, and a very flexible throughput. And we performed analysis using the Torrent Suite Ion Reporter, and I, I will show that we can detect variants down to 0.1% using this platform. In addition, for those labs that have access, there is the Oncomine knowledge base that allows um, help with annotation and reporting of a large number of variants. So one of the challenges in working with cell-free DNA is the lower limit of detection. And so next generation sequencing is gen in general is known to have artifacts that appear as variants below 5% variant allele frequency in the results. And so if you think about a tumor that has um, perhaps multiple clones within it, so perhaps you have a blue clone within your tumor that has a common uh, variant within it, but you also have a red clone which has a common variant and also additional more rare variants. When you take a sample from this tumor and test it by next generation sequencing, you will get um, both detection of the common mutation, which appears in all the reads. So for example, the C that appears in all the reads here would be a common mutation. And you would also get the subclone specific mutations. So for example, here the T that appears in a couple reads. But the difficulty is then detecting these, this T that appears in a couple reads from the variant that appears in this column, the C, which is just a sequencing error. And so this really is the, the challenge of using next generation sequencing for low level variants, is trying to detect real variants at low levels from things that might be sequencing errors. And so the approach that the Oncomine CFDNA assays take to this is to use the core technology uh, shown in this image. So the core technology consists of an amplification-based assay that generates tagged DNA copies from each strand of a DNA target molecule. And so after amplification and tagging and sequencing, the use of these molecular tags allows the strands of the original molecule to be associated with each other. And so this can help to identify molecules containing a variant from those that might be errors and not match to the same original DNA molecule. And so in this way, the assay allows for a very low level limit of detection. So this slide is data from Thermo Fisher and shows, just as an example, some late stage lung cancer research samples that were analyzed using the Oncomine lung CFDNA assay. And you can see of, across these six samples, there are variants in several different genes, EGFR, TP53, et cetera. And in the FSP tumor tissue tested, the variants appear at relatively high levels. Um, and in plasma, there is a much lower uh, level of the same variant, as you would expect because of the issue of many other types of DNA and, and fewer actual copies of DNA being present in the cell-free DNA extracted from plasma. You will also notice that the numbers in bold here are the somatic mutations present only from the tumor tissue, and not bolded are the germline mutations, which appear at relatively similar frequencies both in the FFP and in the plasma. So overall, this slide then is showing a high correlation between the variants called in FFPE and those called in plasma. And uh, again, another uh, slide from Thermo Fisher. This was data from an Onco Network consortium where they had to use this assay and assess the limit of detection using a very helpful cell-free DNA reference set, the Horizon CFDNA multiplex reference set. And this reference set includes the eight variants across that are shown across the top 
in gray. And what in the study was diluted to the uh, amount shown on the left, 0.11 1 and 5%, as well as assessing 100% wild type control. So you can see that the, the assay, the CFDNA lung assay, performed very well to detect these eight variants at the levels that approximate what was expected based on dilution of the reference set uh, put into the assay. Okay, so now to get into our, our research study at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. So our study um, originally started with 63 non-small cell lung cancer research samples from peripheral blood that were collected in Strec cell-free DNA blood collection tubes. And all 63 of these research samples were taken from individuals who had previously had tumor tissue tested and were positive for EGFR sensitizing mutations, most typically the exon 19 deletion or the L858R mutation. Uh, and as I had mentioned, we obtained about 8 to 12 mils of plasma from 20 mils of peripheral blood, and we used the CHIAMP circulating nucleic acid kit to extract the cell-free DNA. The concentration that we obtained was ranged between uh, 0.2 to 26 nanograms per microliter, and the total DNA amount, median was 70 nanograms, but a range of about 8 to 1.6 micrograms. So just a, a comment about the uh, collecting peripheral blood sample, research samples for CFDNA. Um, we do currently use these uh, STREC tubes, um, mainly because the samples are so rare and precious and we want to maximize our chance of having cell-free DNA obtained. The STREC tubes do have preservatives within them that stabilize the nucleated blood cells and so prevent release of genomic DNA from those cells. And we also find that being based in Canada and having samples sent from some distance in some cases, these, the, the samples are stable for up to 14 days at room temperature as per the manufacturer. And based on this publication, does reduce the need for immediate plasma preparation after collection. So I'll show our CFDNA assay um, analysis from the Thermo Fisher assay, but I wanted to first just present our, our comparison. So for these 63 samples, we did do a comparison between um, di droplet digital PCR and next generation sequencing using the CFDNA lung assay. So just to give you an overview of the droplet digital PCR that we used, um, droplet digital PCR is, is another way to get at detection of low levels of mutations. If you think first about uh, a typical PCR reaction, you have many samples, many particles within your sample that are wild type, and this may be in vast excess of the molecules within your sample that are mutant. And yet, when you take a regular PCR and amplify this tube, you end up with an average signal so that you basically drowned out the signal from your mutant. What digital droplet PCR will do instead is to actually separate your PCR reaction into many individual droplets. And so the, the starting material is segregated into droplets and then amplified. And this allows you to then calculate using statistics the, the number of the original mutant, um, the mutant molecule that was in your starting sample. And the type of results that you get from DDPCR are shown here. The most important, um, most important data is shown within these three quadrants, the mutant quadrant that are cell molecules pardon me, droplets containing only mutant molecules, this quadrant which are droplets containing only wild type, and this, this quadrant which are droplets containing both mutant and wild type molecules. And this slide then just shows what you would expect from various um, diminishing amounts of mutant molecules, 1% all the way down to 0 0.01. And it's by assessment of the molecules that appear within this window that you can estimate the amount of mutant molecules in your starting, starting sample. 
So for DDPCR, we validated, we could detect down to 0.1% mutant, but really we validated it to be very reproducible at 0.5%. So that was our limit of detection for the DDPCR assay for the T790M mutation in EGFR. So then when we started with the using the cell-free DNA lung assay, we did start, as recommended, testing the Horizon CF DNA multiplex reference set that I had mentioned before. Uh, and so again, the, this sample had eight variants that we diluted to the different percentages shown on the left. We did have very good detection and very good correlation with what was expected for this sample. Uh, the only one that we found we could not detect at 0.1% was the EGFR exon 19 um, deletion. We weren't very concerned with this, though, because we did know from our DDPCR experience that 0.1% was hard for us to achieve every single time. And this was really just our first assessment of the assay, and so we felt with some experience we were likely to be able to improve that. And so this, back to the, the 63 samples that I mentioned we had tested for this study. Uh, this gives you an overview then of the samples tested by DDPCR and an overview of their results for pass and fail, and the samples tested by the lung CFDNA oncomine assay. So as, as I had mentioned, for DDPCR, we only had set up the assay for EGFR T790M. For, e, for DDPCR, each assay is one specific mutation, um, unless you multiplex. We hadn't multiplexed. And so our DDPCR only picked up EGFR T790M. Whereas for the Oncomine lung, we were testing, obviously, the 11 genes and hotspots within those. The amount of input DNA we used was the same for both. Um, the sensitivity for DDPCR we really felt was 0.5%, and for Oncomine we had a sensitivity down to 0.1%. An interesting thing that we found, though, was that for DDPCR, of the 63 that we tested, three of them were insufficient, so we only tested um, 60 in total. Of those 60, 11 actually failed on DDPCR and 49 passed. The failure on DDPCR was um, reproducible for us, so if we went back to the original sample, it still failed. We're still trying to investigate w why that might be, but it does seem to be something inherent in the original sample that um, prevents it from carrying on in DDPCR. It really um, prevents formation of the beads. Whereas for the Oncomine lung CF DNA uh, NGS assay, we had a very good pass rate. Uh, 60 of 61 actually passed, and two were insufficient for that. So just to give you a quick overview then of the sort of key run metrics across the runs that we did for this set of research samples. Um, the, the key metrics are across the top here, and the runs are shown in sequential order from our first run to the fifth. So I, to begin, I just want to mention the first run, we were using the 540 chip on the S5XL. And to start, we weren't sure what batching would be appropriate, so we started with eight samples. But clearly, we had um, really a lot more capacity. And so for the next two runs, two to five, we increased that to 16 samples per chip, which seemed to give a lot better, um, closer to the total reads that you would expect on that kind of uh, chip capacity. And um, I, I really feel that sort of by the time we got to our fifth run, our expertise was much better at just using the panel. And so we had, you know, a very good total reads um, and total um, basis called uh, loading and low polyclonal, et cetera. Some of the, the metrics that are shown in red here were a bit less than we might have expected, but it did improve with our experience, and overall the data from all of these runs was very usable. Um, the, 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 these metrics still were in a very usable range, so we had no concern with the performance of the assay. And this slide then shows um, more detailed metrics specific to each of the 60 samples, just as an example of things like the uh, mean depth uh, and the coverage of, of these different uh, samples. And so again, all of these metrics for the vast majority of the samples were met or exceeded what was recommended. Um, I did highlight at the bottom two samples. 
um, one of which failed, which I called 61 in this slide, and then one which was suboptimal, so didn't quite meet the metrics that, that we would have expected or that the other samples met. Um, but still the data from that sample was, was still quite reliable in comparison to DVPCR. Um, so I, I did mention then previously that we had a, a number of samples that failed on DDPCR and that worked well in the oncomine assay. Of, and this was 11 of the 60 samples. Of these, four were actually positive for the EGFR 279EM on the CFDNA NGS assay with a range between 0.1% to, to almost 2%. And so this just is, um, you know, sort of supports the idea that um, we may be able to detect variants from the Oncomine CFDNA lung assay that we wouldn't be able to detect using only DDPCR. Um, and this slide then is a comparison of the EGFR 2790M results from both the DDPCR and the Oncomine. From the DDPCR, we had, and, and sorry, just to, to also remind you, this is of the 49 samples that were positive on both assays, 49 being the number that was um, positive on DDPCR. So of the ones, the 22 that were positive on DDPCR, uh, allele frequency is shown here for T79EM, uh, all of these were also positive on the Alkaline lung CFDNA assay. And the ones that we thought were sort of low positive, a bit below what we would normally call from DDPCR, uh, also positive on the Alkaline. And in addition, the DDPCR gave us negative results for 25, and Alkaline only gave us negative results for 15. And so this really means that we had nine additional samples that had T790M detected on cell-free DNA by the um, Alkaline lung CFDNA assay, but not by DDPCR. So these nine samples then um, were, had EGFR T790M in the range of 0.1 to 2.6%. So certainly some of these may be below what we would expect to be able to detect by DDPCR, but certainly some are in the range that we would have expected to find by DDPCR. Um, and so again, this shows sort of the additional benefit that, that we found in using the NGS approach to CFDNA. And because of the, the difference between the allele frequencies of GDPCR and NGS, we just wanted to compare how, how the 279EM variant allele frequencies compared between these two assays. And so this graph shows the variant allele frequency percent from the Oncomine assay uh, on the y-axis and then the variant allele frequency from DDPCR on the x-axis. And there was very good correlation between those two. Um, and so we, you know, we felt that this did sort of support the variant allele frequency calling between these two assays. I did mention previously that we appreciated that there was additional genes within the lung CFDNA NGS assay that we could also test at the same time as testing for EGFR. And this just shows some of the variants that we also found in these samples uh, in additional genes. Um, so some of the EGFR results are listed here, but in addition we found variants in NRAS, um, PIC3CA, and KRAS. And at a very similar type of level that we found for EGFR. So for many of these variants, we could detect it down to 0.1%. So as I mentioned, one of the real challenges of CFDNA is actually being able to achieve a very low limit sensitivity, a very low limit of detection. And so there are certain criteria within the assay that help you understand if your data is of a high enough quality to have achieved a 0.1% sensitivity. And those criteria, the, the key criteria are shown here. Um, the mean depth, which is recommended for 0.1% sensitivity to be greater than 20,000. Medium molecular coverage, um, which is recommended to be greater than 1,500 and then targets um, greater than 0.8 medium molecular coverage, um, which is recommended to be greater than 80%. And these three criteria are available on um, the sheets, the user sheets that can be obtained from Thermal Fisher. 
And so in our data then of the 61 that, that performed, uh, that we had results from in the NGS, uh, we had very good, um, very good um, meeting of these metric limits. So even for the most strict criteria, which is the targets greater than 0.8 medium molecular coverage, uh, we still had um, 52 of our 61 samples that actually met or exceeded that. So we felt that in, in the majority of our samples, we were able to meet the metrics that allowed us to achieve a 0.1% sensitivity. And um, overall, then, this just shows our Oncomine lung CFDNA assay results. Of the 60 that we tested, 37 were positive. And of these 37, um, 36 of these also had an EGFR sensitizing mutation, um, typically the exon 19 deletion or L858R. Uh, one of them that actually had T790M posit was positive at a low level of 0.1%, we did not detect any other EGFR variant. Uh, so that may just represent, um, you know, just some difference in the ability of detect eat all of the EGFR variants at that low level. And 23 of the samples then were negative for T790M. Of the other EGFR variants we found in the, the T790M negative samples, we did confirm um, that there were other EGFR mutations within those samples. So for example, exon 19 deletion L858R or G719S. And so this is useful because it does still indicate that the tumor was releasing cell-free DNA with interperitheal circulation. Um, but that T790M wasn't detected. So by including these additional sensitizing mutations within the test, it does give you some, um, some measure of confidence that the tumor was releasing cell-free DNA, which would be different than if you had a completely negative um, test result on, um, on an assay. And finally, as I mentioned, that we did detect variants in other genes. Most commonly, these were variants in TP53, but we did find um, uh, one variant in NRAS and one variant in PIK3CA. And so the potential benefit of, of NGS then over using a single mutation assay like DDPCR is detection of variants in these other genes. And so finally then, just to, to summarize um, our use of the Oncomine Lung Cell-Free DNA Assay at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, uh, we did find um, that it was very accurate at low level um, inputs of DNA. We did only use 20 nanograms, but we were able to detect down to 0.1% in a majority of our samples. Um, it worked extremely well on, on the S5XL, um, and throughput was um, very um, amenable to the amount that we had to test. And it had good coverage of relevant genes and critical hotspots. Uh, and then finally, just as a thank you to members of our group and collaborators at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, um, in particular, I'd like to thank Tong Zhang from the Advanced Molecular Diagnostics Lab who saw the technical, oversaw the technical work for this, and to thank Thermo Fisher for their support with this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stockley, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get you to your questions, Dr. Stockley will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. Our first question is, what assays was used with the DDPCR solution? 
Uh, sure. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, yes, so we it was just one of the pre-designed assays from the vendor. So we used the BioRad system, so it was one of the BioRad digital PCR assays. Thank you. And the next question is, what differences were notable to you between the DGPCR and NGS workflow? Um, sure. Um, so DDPCR is a, f a fairly simple workflow, um, and, and so uh, NGS, I think, just because of the, the way the technology works, always takes um, a longer time than DDPCR. Uh, but I would say that the workflow, again, we used the chef, which did really help uh, set up for the assay and you know, just achieving a fairly good throughput for the NGS assay in general. Thank you. You mentioned the input DNA amount used for both DDPCR and NGS were 20 nanograms. Did you have an opportunity to test out a lower input amount of DNA? Yes, um, we didn't. At this point, it's still a fairly small number of samples that we used. Um, so we, yes, we haven't tried anything less than that, although I am aware that Thermo Fisher um, does, does uh, mention that it can be used with less DNA, uh, but we didn't ourselves try that. For some of the cell-free uh, horizon control that we used, we actually used a little bit more, uh, but in general, we just stayed with the, the recommended 20 nanograms. Okay. And the next question is, do you have any idea why you had a high rate of failure of CFDNA testing on DDPCR? You mentioned 18%. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in this, and if anyone um, is also experiencing this, I think we would really like to hear about it. Um, uh, we're, really, we're really not sure. I think part of the problem with working with cell-free DNA is that you don't have a lot to go back and, and do the sort of experiment you would want to do, where you could repeat things and try different conditions. Uh, it, although the, the only clue that we have at this point is that if we go back to that same um, sample, that same extraction of cell-free DNA, we do still get a fail on the DDPCR. So, you know, we're trying to investigate if it is something either specific to the samples or something within the extraction. Um, whatever it is, it still allows those samples, though, to go on to NGS, so it must be something specific to the DDPCR, uh, which may not be a surprise because there probably are some uh, just issues inherent in forming the beads and getting them to remain. Okay, the next question is, are amplicon size and primer design between uncommon assay and DDPCR for detection of T790M identical or similar? Uh, yes, I'm, I don't actually know that off the top of my head. I would think, though, just knowing in general the size of, of the oncomine uh, uh, panels and the amplicon legs, probably they are, are similar, yes, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact size off the top of my head. Okay, the next question is, what is the typical fragment size of CFDNA? Do you need a different method to extract, of, extract CFDNA than the one used in the intact cell? Uh, yes, you do. You definitely need a different method um, to extract the CFDNA. It has to be a method that can, uh, you know, work well on a very dilute amount of DNA in a sample. Uh, and then the other question was about what is the size of the cell-free DNA. So that is a known number. Uh, it's about 130 base pairs because it is really the amount of DNA that is um, wrapped around a nucleosome, which is uh, the fragments between the nucleosomes allow for digestion. So that is a known number, and I, th I think in general the majority of it is about 130 base pairs. Okay, the next question is, what extraction kit was utilized to extract the CFDNA? Uh, yes, we use the Kyogen, um, the Kyogen Kimp, uh, sorry, Kyogen Kit. Um, I, I think it's called the Kyamp uh, Circulating Cell-Free DNA uh, Kit that we used. Okay, the next question is, how do you quantify CFDNA? 
Um, just using our, our sort of standard um, quantitation, it is double-stranded, so um, does work in, in many of the, the ways you would normally assess DNA. The next question is, are we able to get access to this test now? Is there a cost to requesting Sentry? Uh, we are just um, still developing it uh, as a, you know, for research use. Um, so I, I can only speak to our center. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's being offered in, in other places, uh, but no, not, not at our center currently. Okay. I would like to once again thank Dr. Stockley for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? Uh, no, just that I would like to thank Thermo Fisher for their support of uh, both for allowing us early access to this assay and for giving us a chance to talk about it today. Thank you. Thank you once again to Dr. Stockley. I would also like to thank LabRoots and Thermo Fisher Scientific Ion Torrent for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on demand from viewing through December 28, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.